Right resolve and right concentration are very closely connected. The beginning of the definition for right concentration, being secluded from sensuality, secluded from unskillful qualities, refers to the work of right resolve. You're resolving to stay away from sensuality. In other words, you're resolved on renunciation. It means you're not going to let yourself get engaged in sensual thinking. You're resolved on non-ill will, i.e. goodwill. And you're resolved on harmlessness, i.e. compassion. So we can actually carry out those resolves. Those are the beginning conditions for getting into right concentration. In fact, one of the suttas talks about two levels of right resolve. There's mundane right resolve and there's noble. And noble right resolve basically is the first jhana. When you've succeeded with clearing out of the mind things like sensuality, ill will, harmfulness. But the concentration also helps with your right resolve. Because a lot of these resolves are not easy to stick with. We can think in the abstract that, yes, it would be a good thing to have the mind free from things like sensual obsession or ill will or harmfulness. But when you actually start living with human beings and putting up with the stresses and strains of daily life, it's very easy to want to go for those things, i.e. sensuality, ill will, harmfulness. And this is where the Concentration helps. It gives you another place for the mind to feed. Because the things that are going to pull us away from right resolve are mainly two. Painful feelings and harsh words. Those are things the Buddha says we should learn how to tolerate. In other words, you have to build up patience for them. And concentration is really good for building up patience. Because when the Buddha is talking about patience, it's not simply a matter of gritting your teeth and putting up with hardships. It's learning how to find a sense of pleasure even in the midst of hardships, so you have something to sustain you. And learning how to get a sense of well-being as you settle in with the body, settle in with the breath. That's good sustenance. So the two factors, right resolve, which is an aspect of discernment and the concentration go together. The discernment begins with the realization that, along with the Four Noble Truths, if the mind is suffering, it's because of something in the mind. I knew an abbot in a monastery in England was talking one time about a number of members of the community complaining all the time. This wasn't right, that wasn't right. And his analysis was really interesting. He says, they don't understand the Four Noble Truths. Because if you spend your time complaining about things outside, even if you're not complaining out loud, just complaining to yourself, you're going to miss seeing what you're doing to make the situation hard to bear, make the situation intolerable. And when you're focused on things outside, the pains outside, the unpleasant things outside, one, it's very easy to want to go for sensual thinking, as the Buddha said. If you don't see any alternative to, to pain, aside from sensual thinking, that's what you're going to go for. And you start thinking about the other people who've caused pain and said nasty things to you, done bad things to you, or people you love, or people you respect, or people you care for. It's very easy to feel ill will and to think, okay, once they're down, once I have the opportunity, I'm going to get some revenge. That's harmfulness. So you've got to turn your thinking around, and concentration helps give you a foundation for doing that. When you can create a sense of well-being inside, and you're feeding on that, then you're less likely to be feeding on things outside and less likely to be complaining about them. You can notice that something's not right. But if it's not interfering with your internal food source, it's a lot easier to find that you can bear with it. The things that we have trouble bearing with are the ones that we bring inside. 
Sometimes you bring them inside simply by the way you breathe. You get upset about something and your breath changes and it becomes intolerable. It's not the situation that's intolerable, it's your breathing is intolerable. But you lash out. So you constantly have to be on the lookout for when the breath changes. One of the reasons why we practice here, sitting with our eyes closed, focusing on the breath, is to make ourselves more and more sensitive to this aspect of the body and its relationship to events in the mind. And then we want to take that sensitivity out into our other activities. So when someone says something displeasing or harsh or nasty, look immediately at your breath to make sure that the breath doesn't get affected. Remember the Buddha's image to Rahula, when he says, meditate like wind, and that's breath is part of the wind element. It doesn't mean just blow your mind around. It means wind can blow disgusting things around, but the wind doesn't get disgusted. In the same way that when it blows pleasant things around, it doesn't get elated. It's just wind. So when there are good or bad things in your environment, try to keep your mind, try to keep your breath on an even keel. And when you've got the breath on your side, that's half the battle right there. Otherwise your greed, your aversion, and delusion, they hijack the breath and they hold it hostage. And they say, okay, we're going to be making a lot of unpleasant feelings here in your body until you do something in line with greed, or aversion, and delusion. And then we'll let it go. Yeah, it's a pretty high price because you're going to be doing some pretty unskillful things. So don't let them take the breath hostage. Try to be on top of how your breathing feels and learn how to breathe in a way that feels good, even when things are falling apart around you. Because that way your head will be a lot clearer when things fall apart around you. And when you're not stabbing yourself with events around you, you'll find that, that mantra we talked about today, I can take this. I can take this. You can survive these things because you're not bringing them in to weigh yourself down. Now, this doesn't mean that you're totally passive when you see there's something that's out of line, something that's inappropriate, and you have the ability to change it. Go ahead and do that. But there are a lot of things in the world, a lot of people in the world that are very hard to change. But as the Buddha pointed out, when we're living with things that we don't like or being separated from things that we do like, the suffering is not in the things that we like or don't like. It's with the clinging and the craving, which means you've got to look inside. This is what right resolve de de deals with. It reminds you these are the things you've got to watch out for. Sensual craving is number one. You've got to be very alert and very attuned to the harm that a lot of your sensual fantasies do. Even if you don't act on them, they, they get the mind in a certain mood when it starts getting sloppy. This doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. All I want is my pleasure. That's the attitude it has. And then when you do start acting on these things, you can cause yourself a lot of trouble and cause other people a lot of trouble, too. So the concentration is there is to give you an alternative pleasure. It's the combination of seeing the drawbacks of sensuality and having this alternative pleasure. That's what enables you to get past that. When you're dealing with difficult people, there's feelings of pain, harsh words. Again, having a place of concentration really helps. Even if you can't occupy the whole body and fill it and suffuse it with pleasure down to every last cell. The fact that you have some part of the body that you can make comfortable allows you to 
take your sustenance there, so that you have the strength to deal with the pain, the strength to deal with the unpleasant words. And because you've got this alternative source of food, you're not out there stuffing those things into your stomach and then finally that they give you indigestion. As John Lee says, you know, when someone else spits out some nasty words and we take them inside to think about it, it's like they've spit something on the ground and we've picked it up when we're eating it. And of course we're going to get we're going to get sick. What are you going to blame? You were the one who picked it up. So even though people are aiming their words at you, you'll have to learn how to sidestep them. And see the words as their karma as having nothing to do with you, even though they're saying your name over and over and over again. Just think that they're aiming at their concept of you, but they're not aiming at you. They can't hit you. In Thailand, one of the insults that's commonly hurled around is you, people get called dogs. And the different Ajans have interesting ways of dealing with that. And John Fun was saying, they call you a dog, you look around, you don't have a tail. And they don't have tails either. So if you're a dog and they look like you, they must be dogs as well. Or John Lee's way of saying it. You look around, you, you know that dogs do have tails. You, you look at yourself, you don't have a tail. Okay, what they're saying is not true. But there is an advantage if they call you a dog. He says, dogs have no laws. So whatever the insult, learn how to look, in a, look at it in a way that gets you out of the line of fire. And to see some humor in the situation, when you can laugh at their insults, you're far away from them. They can't hit you. Now don't laugh out loud at them, because that, that'll cause trouble, but you can laugh to yourself. There's a story in the canon where the monks are traveling, and there's a sectarian from some other sect. And his student were following behind the, the group of the monks. And the student is admiring the Buddha, and the, the teacher is denouncing the Buddha. And the monks got upset because the teacher was denouncing the Buddha. And he says, they, even when people praise me, he said, they don't know what they're talking about. So I should I get upset when they're denouncing me. So if you can have that attitude, that if there is really something true about what they say, you can learn. But otherwise, you just let it go. You can live with a lot of things in this world and not get tempted to do unskillful things in response. Because that's the main problem, is when people do unskillful things to us, there's an immediate tendency for us to turn around and do unskillful things to them. And that goes for things that we like as well as for things we don't like. So we've got to learn how to resist the temptation to do the unskillful things that we like, or to respond to the unskillful things that we like in unskillful ways, or to respond to the unskillful things that we don't like in unskillful ways. Right resolve helps with a combination of right concentration. Yes, the resolve brings in the element of discernment. Because simply learning how to breathe, simply learning how to be calm in the face of something, doesn't deal with the whole problem. There's a problem of the I and the me that gets in the way, and it's feeling injured by these things. And if you can learn how to take those concepts apart, to see what, whatever I you have doesn't have to be in the line of fire. And it's not harmed by the other things that other people do to you.
then you put yourself in a position of safety. So you really can carry right resolve into the world with all of its messiness and keep it intact. This is a principle for all the factors of the path. They're not designed simply for situations where the practice is easy and the conditions are good. They're meant to be followed all the time. When they're easy, when they're hard. When the world outside is supporting you, when the world outside is not supporting you. You want to have the world with all in terms of your virtue and your concentration and discernment to protect your path, i.e. to protect your thoughts, your words, and your deeds, to keep them in line with what you know will ultimately lead to true happiness, to the true end of suffering. When you keep that goal in mind, you realize that a lot of the other baggage that you tend to carry with you is a problem, then you can let it go.